seems to be true of many of us Indians that the familiarity of living among some of the most valued treasure troves of art and cultural artifacts somehow dims our vision to their astounding beauty till someone else comes along and clears the cobwebs for us. Rajasthan is one such minefield of art but we needed a celebrity artist to open our eyes to the architectural marvels such as Maharaja Jai Singh's observatories and the numerous step wells that dot the state. The celebrity artist is none other than Richard Cox and it is due to his monumental exercise of discovery, recovery and documentation that over 300 step wells in Rajasthan, Gujarat, Haryana, Madhya Pradesh and Delhi have been saved from further ruin. Richard Cox first came to India in 1993 to set up the Wales Rajasthan Visual Arts Exchange. The project was supported by the Charles Wallace India Trust, the British Council, INTAC and the Arts Council of Wales. The project lasted about five years but Cox's attachment to India continues. In 2007 he engaged in a research tour of Gujarat and Rajasthan visiting Stepwell sites and three of the Janta Mantar sites to document and record images. Return visits each year since then have extended this work and added to and expanded the touring exhibition in India, UK and the USA called Subterranean Architecture in Western India. During 2010, he worked with INTAC documenting step wells in Haryana for their recent publication on the state's national heritage. Richard Cox has also dealt with architectural influences from Japan, where he was artist in residence in the Fine Arts Department at Hichiyama University in 2003. Cox's twist with art goes back to his early days as a student of fine art for eight years. He moved to Wales in 1975, beginning his career with teaching in UK and abroad. He has been a visiting lecturer at the Royal College of Art, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and the Delhi College of Art, among others. He was visual arts officer with the Southeast Wales Arts and the Arts Councils of Wales running the Artist in Residence program between 1983 to 98. From 2004 to 2013, he was a senior lecturer at the Cardiff School of Art and Design and director of Howard Gardens Gallery. Over the last decade, he has had a series of solo exhibitions in the UK, India, Norway, Canada, USA, Belgium and Japan. During this period, he has organized over 60 solo and group exhibitions presenting the work of over 254 different practitioners in fine art, craft, photography and architecture disciplines. Richard Cox has a strong connection not just with India's past glory but also a common area of interest, albeit in a very different way, with aspirational young people today. He too has had a fascination for cars, especially American cars, since the late 1960s. It is the designs of cars that interest him most. These are featured in his drawings and he has worked and visited the USA many times, developing an extensive visual archive on the subject. We welcome you to India once again, sir, and to have our eyes opened not only to our heritage but also to your art. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, like my colleagues, I'm most grateful to be invited here today, and an old friend, Avjadit, and a new friend, Daiwan. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and for doing such a, an excellent job. Uh, many of us have been to conferences, and they're not always perfectly organised, but it seems to me uh, you've got everything right. Um, I can't remember a time uh, in my childhood when I didn't have a sketchbook. Um, I always drew. Um, I suppose not long after the Second World War, I would draw uh, warplanes, things of that nature. But I would always draw. And uh, the other thing that I 
felt I could work with uh, at a young age was sport. I, 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 I was a runner and a, a jumper and so forth. The thing is, during my childhood, my mother was seriously ill. And every winter, she would find herself in hospital. And I would be staying with relatives or with my grandparents. And because of this, I attended 12 different schools. And sometimes I would go to a different school every year. So there was a great fragmentation in my, uh, my education. I think the thing that kept me together was the fact that in each successive institution I went to as a child, uh, I could always do well in art and sport. And so when I left school, it, it seemed to me logical to go to art school. Um, and at that time, there was a more benign regime. And the government would accept students like myself who were academically indistinguished. Uh, undistinguished, and uh, allow us in on what was known in those days as exceptional talent. And when I started in art school, which was in South London Sea, um, I came across and met uh, 19 other uh, young people like myself who similarly were very enthusiastic and uh, interested in the arts, but like myself, had few academic qualifications, which you needed in order to progress to a first degree course. And through the inspirational teaching of two particular tutors, to which I shall always be grateful and always remember with great affection, um, we had three years together getting enough GCEs in order to qualify for a, a first degree course. But because, this, because of this circumstance, uh, we live very close to London, they encouraged us uh, uh, to go and see everything we possibly could. So over a period of three years, I didn't miss any single major exhibition in London. I went to the Oldwich Theatre to see Harold Pinter. Uh, I joined the Singers Club to see Ewan McCall and um, Bob Davenport. And we had a great liberal education, something which uh, I think is a precious thing. The art school system is something I, I have great affection for. And this led me on to my first degree and then further study a postgraduate uh, in Birmingham and UCL. Um, the reason I tell you this is because things have changed and just as I had those opportunities without ac ac academic qualifications, uh, but was allowed to carry on and to gain them, I was also supported through grant aid. I received postgraduate scholarships and it was possible to do all these things because of that support which I applaud in retrospect. Um, unfortunately, I, I teach now in a university in Cardiff, and the students I teach don't have those advantages. Um, they, in fact, they have to take student loans and they have to pay them back. And uh, I, I think that's a detrimental step. We had that chance to do it. I think now, if I had left school with the few qualifications I had, it would not be impossible for me to progress. And it may be there are, there are young artists out there who are in the same dilemma. Anyway, I wanted to do that as a, uh, as a preamble because um, I, I feel fortunate to have had that connection and to have met those people and to work with those people. Uh, if I could have the first slide, please. Um, and I would like to have shown you early work. Um, uh, when I went through my slide collection, I was trying to digitize them, and unfortunately, they're in very poor condition. And I, this is the only picture I could salvage, which goes back to 1975. It's part of my first Arts Council one-man show in Cardiff. Uh, I moved there in 1975, having quit my job as a teacher, um, because I felt if I could make a living um, as a painter before I was 30, that would be a good thing to do. Um, uh, nearly all the artists I know, and there are many honourable exceptions, we have not been able to support our practice simply through the production of our work and sale of our work. So we take on other jobs. In my case, and in many others, I, I taught in various art schools uh, uh, for many years. Uh, and then went in later as a, an arts administrator, working as a senior visual arts officer at the Arts Council, creating opportunities that uh, some of which I'd had and some of which I wanted to, other people to have. This is um, a piece which is part of what I call the Ramp series. And if you can imagine uh, the two projecting um, bars in front of you, 
um, they are on a delicate balance, rather like the arms of uh, a, a, a record, record player arm. And the wooden bars on top with the blue and green slate, if you take those off, the entire system rocks on a, a, a cedar beam. And it's supported behind by a three metre wide um, uh, a painting, which uh, I used an industrial spray gun on. This is the only slide I have from the show. There, there were 14 paintings in this show. If we can move to the next slide, please. I'm um, moving forward now, um, 20 years. Uh, I was working at this time as artist in residence at uh, uh, Trondheim Kunst Center uh, in Trondheim. Um, uh, the Norwegian education system is impressive. They have only three academies in Bergen, Trondheim, and Oslo. And in order to be able to, be able to teach in one of these academies, you must have a master's degree. But you cannot do a master's degree in Norway, which means that all the people who teach in Norway uh, either are artists from Norway who have left the country gained a master's degree and returned, or are people like myself uh, who came from outside. Uh, they also have an unusual system there, which is called um, tenure. Well, it, sorry, it, it's not called tenure, it's the, the opposite of tenure. It means that all people who teach in a Norwegian art school can teach for a maximum of five years um, in each academy. So no person can actually hold a space uh, teaching in any one academy for more than five years. And that is four years plus one year permission. Permission being you are given one year uh, fully paid time off in order to work uh, as an artist uh, with financial support. Now, I always thought this was an excellent idea. And uh, I, when I started at the Arts Council, I was asked to design a program for the visual arts uh, because they, at that time, uh, there was nobody dealing in this particular field um, in the way that I've I wanted to. And so I set up forward a program of artists in residence which ran for 15 years uh, until I left. And this placed artists in various public venues uh, and I set up a number of different scenarios. Um, the residences could be uh, relatively short for perhaps just eight weeks and those were the international program and the work we did in Rajasthan was of that nature. We invited artists to work with us for a two-month period, uh, at the end of which time they would have a, um, an exhibition. Um, we had artists' residences that would go from six months to a year, and they might be based in libraries, or um, uh, they could be in hospitals or community centres. And they were um, ones where the artists made direct contact with the public, worked with them on common projects, um, major mural paintings, um, uh, uh, sensory gardens in hospitals uh, and then we had long-term projects which would be three years or more and those were more of usually based in hospitals um, our longest running hospital project ran for 11 years and mostly they lasted for five and we set them up in such a way that they would become self-generating um, in the first year of a project we would allow uh, uh, we will pay half the cost of the residency and the institution that uh, hosted us, they would pay the other 50%. So if, if the residency was 20,000 a year, um, we would pay half each. In the second year, if the, the host wished to carry on, we would reduce our contribution to 33% and in the third year it would be reduced to 25% in such a way that on the fourth year it was completely self-funding, releasing the money to uh, be spent on other projects. And uh, from the, when we started the project, I had a budget of 12,000 pounds in 1983. And when I left the project in 1998, we had a, quarter, we had a project of a quarter of a million. And uh, this allowed nearly 200 appointments to be made. And with very, very few exceptions, these people worked with extraordinary valor and sensitivity and uh, I have the greatest respect and ad admiration for the contribution they made. This is, in fact, me working as article as myself. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about Beamer Centre for Contemporary Arts in Omaha. 
It's uh, a major residency program which allows um, 20 artists a year to work on three-month residencies. They're given a full stipend, an enormous studio. My studio here was 55 feet by 44 feet. Uh, it had living accommodation and, uh, uh, and you had no obligations at all except to yourself to work. I would get up at six in the morning, I'd work all day, six days a week and take one day a week off and uh, working with five other artists. And Riel Shonla, who was the director at that time and the creator of the place, has my uh, gratitude and um, uh, uh, I, I remember those experiences. I, I did two residences there in uh, 1999 and 2002. The second one uh, culminated with an exhibition. They have uh, two very large galleries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is called the Weapon Series um, because it makes reference to two things that are close to my heart. Um, at school, I was a member of CND. It is interesting to note, by the way, that on the last Alderman Master March in 1963, I was a schoolboy marching, and what I did not know was in another part of that march I was, another, I was a schoolgirl, and uh, we didn't meet for another 30 years, I think, but she's my wife, and it would have been great to have met her. Um, but uh, she shares my passion. She, by the way, is a scientist, not a, an artist, and uh, I have... Anyway, that's another thing. Um, I also have been a long-term member of Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and some other organizations. When I was doing my residency in uh, Norway, um, I was basing paintings uh, partly on the extraordinary spatial qualities that we experience in the interior of Japanese traditional buildings. Uh, I have been to Hiroshima and Kyoto and Tokyo uh, when I was artist in residence at Hajayama, University, and the traditions of architecture, the, the proportions of Japanese gardens uh, are as close to a kind of um, measurable perfection as I can find anywhere. But sadly, both the Japanese and the Norwegians are non-signatory to the anti-whaling treaty, which I find greatly disturbing. Uh, these fantastic beasts are being slaughtered. And I was making a long series of paintings which both incorporated the notion of these proportions. And I placed on these wooden bars. Now, these are not harpoons, clearly. They are pieces of wood tied together with string. And, um, but they allude to it. I would always wish my paintings to be read in their, for their formal qualities, their colour, for their proportions, and so forth. You do not need to know this information, but it is one of the reference points I have, one of the many reference points I have. In the introduction, there was mention of my long-standing and bizarre interest in the, the vagaries of American style styling in the mid-20th century. I'm not showing any of those slides tonight, but um, uh, I, I have, like many artists, multiple interests, and I divide my life up and my time in the studio working on different things. Today, I'm looking mostly at my interest in painting and related things. And at the end of the talk, I would like to talk a little about Stepwells. Um, next slide, please. Um, this crossed a line, really, between the weapon series and another series. Uh, uh, I, I wonder if any of you in the audience have seen an amazing film by Kira Kurosawa. It's called Red Beard. Um, it's a stunning film about... Uh, a country doctor, and um, uh, how he goes to work with a young uh, doctor in, who, who has expected to be employed by royalty, and he has to come to terms with uh, a loss of status. And throughout the film, there's a theme of trust. And there is a moment in the film, which I remember vividly, in which uh, a, a young girl who has been traumatized finally accepts the trust of the doctor. And uh, this is symbolized by giving something. And she wore a kimono with um, the flights of feathers um, as a symbol. Interestingly enough, this same kimono is worn by one of the warriors in The Seven Samurai, uh, Kurosawa's most famous film. And the stripe down the center of this painting, which, by the way, is 16 feet wide, um, also 
looks as if it could be a weapon because it is from the flights of arrows. So it has a similar um, correlation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I did a series of these paintings uh, when I was at Arts in Residence at Delhi College of Art in 1999. Um, this was two years after I'd left the Arts Council, and, uh, but was still maintaining my interest in this. Um, we organized a series of exhibitions which celebrated the work of the artists from India who came to the UK and exhibited with us and also exhibited in, in India. Um, at the time, I was expecting to have a solo show at the Queen's Gallery in the British Council, which is where the show is. But for uh, a, a completely innocent reason, three of the artists had not been included in the, the joint show which had been previously organised. So those three artists joined me in the Queen's Gallery and we exhibited together. Um, uh, and it is Lalit Sharma on the far right and Bupesh Kavidar in the centre and Shahid Bavaz who's standing next to me. Uh, and they're all excellent artists. Uh, uh, they had not any of them exhibited outside of India when I first met them. They now all exhibit internationally. And uh, they are most interesting uh, and skillful artists. And it's a real ple pleasure and privilege to uh, have been working with them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on the right, Shushma Bahal. Uh, I could not have done half the things I did in Rajasthan if it had not been for Shushma. Uh, when I arrived in Delhi for the first time in my life, not knowing anything, I'd never been to India before, I was used to working formally. I was used to receiving formal letters inviting me to do this. And basically, I arrived at the airport into a wall of heat. It was September. It was 35 degrees and humid. And there was a white ambassador and a guy with a white turban and a white suit waiting for me. This was an indication that they were going to look after me. And they drove me to the British Council and I met Shushma and Chandrika Grover, her incredibly able assistant. And basically, the day I arrived, it all started happening. And I had thought when I arrived in Rajasthan, I would admit, meet one or two people who might be interested in hosting a residency or perhaps doing exchange. I didn't know what to expect. The thing is, the exchange in, with India was not planned. I was supposed to be setting up an exchange with Barcelona. My director had asked me to do this because Barcelona was city of culture. It had the Olympics. We had just spent a quarter of a million pounds in a theatre company there. But my good friend, Sue Hunt, a painter, had just returned from India, and she said, why don't we do an exchange with India? She sat on my advisory panel. Um, because there are, you know, the, the riches of, of uh, Barcelona are, are not being replicated elsewhere. So I, I did, when I, when I wrote to Shushma, I, I asked her what her views were. Did she feel it would be a, an interesting thing to do, to match Wales, a small principality, with more sheep than human beings and uh, three, less than three million people, with the devastated Rajasthan with 42 million people. Was, what, did they, she think this was an interesting match? I, I, I thought it was. Uh, and she was very enthusiastic, and, um, and, which is why I came about. Um, uh, and Rajiv Roshan I had got to know because on my previous visit, setting up the exchange earlier, um, uh, I, wor I worked with him as a visiting lecturer in the MA department. Rajiv ran the MA department at Delhi College of Art before he became the director of the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, again, a, a very supportive uh, uh, man uh, of terrific intelligence and a great photographer. Um, next slide, please. Um, my, my background in painting really is partly to do with my age and my experience when I, my formative years. Um, when I was uh, at college um, doing my first degree, I was particularly interested in reductive painting, um, uh, formalist painting. Um, I, I remember traveling to Paris to meet Robert Morris, who was holding an exhibition at Sonderben Gallery, because I thought his work was really interesting, and I wanted to know why, I wanted to know how. And I figured the best way to do that would be to get it straight from the horse's mouth. But of course, when I arrived in Paris, having not done my research, it turns out that Robert Morris had never been to Paris. He sent the instructions for his work to be made by technicians, and they had made the work. 
So I found the technicians and I found a translator because my French is useless. And we spent an afternoon discussing it. And it taught me so much about how Morris worked. Uh, and in fact, many of the things he was, which was to do with proportion and volume and materials. And it taught me, it taught me a lot. And these were the people, and Don Judd and, uh, uh, were people that inspired me at that time. And um, it's, I, I still feel great affection for this particular kind of painting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one kind of iconography which is universal, it can be found across the world, uh, is the chevron. But my particular association with it happens to be rooted in Jaipur. Um, I have been on many occasions to the City Palace and admire their collection. They have a wonderful collection of books. Um, but in the courtyard where there are four extraordinary doorways, one of the doorways has set into the side of it uh, narrow green chevrons, which are slightly fading, and you can see through them. And it, it is that particular point of reference that I, I, I picked up. And I started using it as a, a device in my paintings. Uh, and it's a point at which the, the weapon series painting, of which there is about 35 in the series, um, started transmuting and changing into a new series, which I gave the generic title of Jagmandir, following a, a, um, a visit to one of the islands in Udapur, which, um, which at that time had a series of deserted temples in it which were very overgrown. You can't visit them anymore because they've closed it off, but in the 1990s you could explore the island and, and see the, uh, uh, the temples, and, and they, they had some wonderful um, floors which included the chevron motif, which is an, the other source. Um, by the way, the residences we organized um, before I left were based in Jodhpur and Udapur and Jaipur mostly. And on the first trip that uh, Shushma was so helpful with, uh, I visited um, Jodhpur to set the residency up in the fortress. And um, I, I had one of those experiences that coming from a, another culture, you just never forget. Uh, in the morning, I'm walking in the market and I gave some rupees to a man who had no arms. Uh, I was told by somebody, never give money to beggars. I, for me, that doesn't make any sense at all. I've got pocketfuls of rupees and, and why on earth not? And in the afternoon, I was having gin and tonics with the Maharaja of Jodhpur in this enormous living room, which was covered by one single carpet. It was so big you could have played cricket in there. And it took him about four minutes to agree um, that we could have the Maharina's Palace as a studio in the fortress. And we spent the next three quarters of an hour talking about his car collection because he's got a fantastic car collection. He owns a Delahaye. These are incredibly rare, very beautiful uh, Hispaniola cars from the States. And uh, I think one is featured in a, a film I saw. Which it, it, must be, it must be his. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is from uh, an exhibition I had in 2005 uh, and, uh, at Newport Art Gallery. Um, I said things are changing. Um, Newport Art Gallery has closed. They have, um, they have made redundant the curator, cura curatorial staff who are wonderful, incredibly hardworking and sensitive. Uh, and they have stored the museum uh, this is three years after Newport became a city. And it seems to me that the worst thing they could have possibly do is to close down the museum and art gallery. Uh, I organized six or seven exhibitions there over a 40-year period. In fact, the first time I ever organized an exhibition in my life was as a second-year student at Newport College of Art. I approached the curator of... Newport Gallery, which had just opened. The old gallery had closed, and they had opened this brand new gallery. And I approached him and I said, I'd like to organize the first show in their gallery. It was a very large gallery. And um, I made a selection of uh, 12 artists. Um, four artists were members of staff at my college. Four artists were students who had left and moved on. Uh, and, uh, and four artists were 
uh, including myself and three other current students. And this show is called NTE, uh, because I could not think of a title for this show. So I called it NTE, which is No Title Exhibition. Uh, and it was, in, it was in this particular gallery. Uh, and 40 years later, the gallery no longer exists. Mm. Yes, sorry, yes, next slide. Uh, this is one of the most recent uh, uh, of the, the pieces which, um, as I say, straddles these, the two uh, fields of painting, uh, Jagmandir series, which I'm going to show in a minute, and um, the weapon series. Next slide, please. Um, at this time, I started um, introducing into my work um, handmade boxes. Uh, it's made of wooden perspex. And the harpoon object here was too large to fit in the box, so I snapped the end off. And it, it was called Broken Lance because, as some of you uh, perhaps know, um, the expression Broken Lance refers to a nuclear missile that has gone wrong. Uh, so the title has a, a, a different resonance. The, the painting is very thick in pasto. I was working almost entirely monochromatically here, mostly with, with monochromatic greys and, uh, and uh, dark blues and Venetian reds. Uh, next slide. And it, it, as I say, the, you can see in the top left-hand corner, it is also, uh, the chevron symbol is also coming here. Next slide. Um, the box is developed into a different strand of work. Um, I, I'm just showing a small number, but these are called the Archive Box Series. This is called Minute Box. Um, I bought the um, box itself in a second-hand store. It is a mahogany box, which was designed to contain um, a sheet, uh, a, a, what you call it, um, a projection screen, which I took out. And then, at this, this, this was at the time I was uh, working, in the art, uh, working with the Art Committee. Uh, I was a, a member, and... Uh, the paperwork over the years accumulated and I collect things. I collect all sorts of things. And I collected all the minutes from the Arts Council for 15 years. And because they were, the, the interior of the box was half, if you take a sheet of A4 paper and fold it long ways, it was that depth. So I cut in half all of the minutes um, from the 15 years and I shoved them in this box and just called it the Minutes Box. It is a piece about uh, the bureaucracy of the Art Committee. At its best, it was a really good, uh, you know, a smooth-running machine. At its worst, it, it was a, a, t a time in which you could spend a, an hour discussing grant applications and never actually talk about the work itself. You would just be talking about procedure and about how things cost and what grants were for and, and things. So it was a double-edged sword. Um, I think, by and large, the Welsh Arts Council was a benign organisation and I was uh, pleased to be part of it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this was um, an answer to a different question. Uh, part of me thinks I'm bone idle, I don't make anything. Uh, part of me looks at my studio, which is completely overflowing with work, and I think, how, how did I ever have the time to make all this work? And what on earth am I going to do with it? Um, and I was, for a short time, without a studio. Um, when I left the Arts Council, I also lost my studio because I had been in a, a beautiful studio for seven years. But um, the studio was a temporary arrangement, which was supposed to last for six months, but did last for seven years. But that arrangement came to an end. And then, I, because I became artist in residence uh, at the local university, uh, they gave me a studio, which I could use um, two and a half days a week when the studio, studio was not in use by the students. But I couldn't store things there. Um, so I made a pragmatic decision. Uh, I took about 17 of my largest paintings, some of these 16-foot pieces, and I turned them over and I gridded the back to the exact dimensions of a series of boxes I had, which were archive boxes from my old studio. The old studio had been a library, by the way, a Victorian library. And um, I cut up all the paintings. And then I stacked them in order, numbering them on the back, in such a way that, in theory, if you took out... Can I move around? Yes, I can. But I could take out this bit and then laid it out on a grid you would have a painting eight feet by five feet. If you took out this bit, you'd have another painting. 
You take out this bit, another painting, and another painting. And what I had in fact done, so it's, it's a bit like a floppy disk. Um, when I was I visited Mama once um, on 57th Street, and they had, a, they had a frame this big, and in the frame there was a, there was a microchip that big. And it said, this microchip can perform a million operations a second. I mean, this is, can be, to me, incomprehensible. But the notion of compaction, the notion of condensing, is one that was interesting. And what you have in this column here is the compression of an entire exhibition, which would fill a gallery. But you can only see it end on. So, it, in fact, it, it complies with another of the things that I approve of, which is recycling. I was, in fact, effectively recycling my own work and then representing it. And at the same time, getting some of my studio space back. I started a, a project in 2002, which is completely doomed to failure. It will never work. But its intentions are good. In 2002, my uncle died. Peter. He was 62 years old. He had cancer. He was a really nice guy. I liked him. And he asked me, before he died, if I would clear all of his own, everything he owned. I was his nearest living relative. And it took me six weeks to clear everything he owned, and I had to go through everything. When I went into the, his room, he lived in a bed sitter. He'd had a house in Manchester, but when he moved down to Bristol to teach at the university there, he kept meaning to buy a house, but somehow never quite got round to it. So he lived in a bed sitter, and the bed sitter filled up. And the only way to get into the room was by walking sideways, because it was full of boxes from floor to ceiling. He had 13 computers. He had 18 sets of headphones. Uh, he collected everything. I found, to my astonishment, every private view card and every letter that I had ever sent him. When he came to stay with me and my wife once, I left a note on the table saying, back in 20 minutes, Peter, we're just going around the shops, see you later. I found this note. I found a print I gave to him, which in, in the late 1960s, which he had on the frame on the wall for the last 30 years, uh, had almost completely disintegrated. I, I understand why people collect things, because I do it myself. And uh, I, I must avoid not telling you about that. Next slide, please. Um, this, is, this piece on the right is a piece dedicated to Peter. Uh, Peter was a rambler. He walked. But he, was also, uh, he also took lots of photographs. And one of the things I inherited for him or I, I, was a box this big by this big by this big, completely full of 35 millimeter slides. And he had been on a trip around Europe. And each box was labelled with where he went and when he went. And I worked out by taking all the boxes out, or, or nearly all of the boxes out, exactly where he went and on what dates he went. And then what I did was, these are, these are 35 minute slides seen on the end. So this was a very short trip. And so was this, and this was a longer one. This one with the three diagonal stripes, which he put on, not myself, was a big trip in London. But this goes chronologically over a period of eight years to the places he visited and how he recorded them. And it was a memory piece about Peter, my friend. You know, he left me, one of the things he gave me when, before he died was a set of six plates. They were Italian plates. They were, they were beautiful. And we always use these plates, and every one of them has been broken because we've got a quarry wild tile floor in our kitchen, and I'm clumsy. And I'm sorry to have lost those plates, but actually, every time we used those plates, we remembered him. And, uh, and, and other things. And uh, my most precious possession in the house, if, if there's a fire, after I got my wife out, the, the thing I take with me is a salt setter pot, a salt cellar this big. And it's in the shape of a female bear. And it was mown by my mother. And uh, every time I use that salt cellar, I think of it. And these are both memory pieces. This, this is um, correspondence with friends uh, and, and two ex-girlfriends uh, over a period of 10 years. And when I had my exhibition at Newport, I, I, I expected they would buy something for their collection because they had something. I expected them to buy a large drawing or, or perhaps, if I was lucky, a painting. And to my astonishment, I hadn't even put a price on it, they bought two of my archive boxes. But now that Newport Art Gallery has closed, um, I assume that their collection is, is in the top floor of a leisure centre opposite. 
And so I think it will never be seen again. Next slide, please. Um, this piece on the right is called Days of My Life. And ever since the mid-70s, I've always... I have a very bad memory. I have kept a, a log, a, a wall chart. Each of these charts is around about nine months, nine, ten months. And this is every day of my life from the January the 1st, 1979 to uh, December the 31st, uh, uh, 1990. And it records things I did. Uh, you can just about define, because it's a poor slide, um, some chevrons on it. These are just marking the days off. Um, and uh, I had a, a, a code which would mark days I was in the studio or days I was teaching or whatever. Uh, to give you one idea, this is the minor strike. Uh, you know, a badge. I remember going to Hyde Park to, to join that. And I record um, friends. There are photographs of friends here. Uh, I, I, there are postage stamps. And it's a, a memory piece. But I, I have these wall charts covering a period from 1975 to the present day. I, I'm still doing it to this day. Uh, but they now are not wall charts. They, they now form books. I've Japanese bound them. And um, I keep them as volumes like that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this really was uh, when I came to the end of the archive series. Uh, I stopped making archives. This was, uh, a, this was made from the boxes from the library. Each of these is uh, an archive box um, from the old library. It's a Victorian library. And um, when the council left, um, what happened was um, the old library was closing because the reference floor library was buckling from the weight of books. Uh, the Jagmandir series, which we'll go through rather quickly. I'm sorry about the time. Uh, I, I won't give any commentary next. I always show my studio whenever I give a talk because I'm interested in other people's studios. And uh, this is a series of drawings I'm working on now which are based on the swastika. Uh, these are Conte on paper. And uh, I will go very briefly now through the Stepwell series, which will, I, I, will, I will not take it on. This is Abrahani Chanbauri. It's in Rajasthan, the Dasa Dictionary, just off the Agra Road. And it's one of the most extraordinary places. I could talk at great length, but won't. Next slide. Same well. 200 feet square. Uh, and uh, at, at present empty. Built in 825. And uh, this is above Jaipur. These are photographs taken eight years apart. This is the earlier, this, uh, this is the earlier painting. Uh, this is the later one. Uh, they're part of the touring exhibition, which we refer to in the introduction. Next slide. Um, this, is a, this is also a tank, but it's modern. It's for cattle. And it's in the Thar Desert, and it's one of a whole series of, of modern tanks, which I've photographed. I've just put one in. Next slide. And uh, I, I've been doing some pencil drawings of these. Um, this is Nadusi, which is a, a now dry well in Bundi. Um, Bundi is a great center of step wells. Next slide. Uh, another drawing of the same well. Uh, uh, just hold this for a moment. Um, this, is a, this is one of the most important and most beautiful step wells in, in India. Um, it's Ranji Kibari. It was built um, by the wife of a Maharaja who built 22 wells. It's in marble. It's 60 meters long, 40 meters wide, and 46 meters deep. And it's symbolized by the elephant with the raised trunk, which is a symbol of good luck. And it is one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture I've ever seen. If anybody has not been to Bundi, I urge you. It's worth it just for this one step well. Yet there is said to be 60 there. I've only actually managed to document 17. Next slide, please. The total revising. And uh, it's part of um, um, uh, Hadirani, which is a royal, royal well, big square well. Next slide. Uh, and this is Naku, which is an Amir, just outside. Um, Right, uh, outside Jaipur, it's uh, near the um, Amber Fort. Next slide. Uh, and this is this is also Narco. So I'm different. Now. I photographed it in November this year, and the water had got up to here, 
And when I photographed it in 2007, uh, it was completely dry. Next slide. Um, this is also in Bundi. And in fact, it's a very small part of a very large uh, kund. Um, and I was photographing from about 100 meters away, just on the temple part of it. And the earlier photograph is the one on the left with the blue, and the later one is, 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 is the one on the right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is, um, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this, Babot Martini. Uh, it's an immense well. It's huge. And it's in the middle of nowhere with a tiny village attached to it. And uh, I, why such an enormous well seems to be completely deserted, I am not quite sure. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, this is one of my favorite wells. I go back to this well every time I come to Indy. It's Panamina Kakund. It's in Amir. And um, this, is, uh, this was photographed in about 2000. And uh, a couple of years later, they were in the process of repainting it. Uh, they spent a great deal of money restoring this well. And uh, it's a very beautiful well. The proportions are wonderful. It's a royal well, too. And uh, uh, I bring students here twice a year, and I always take them to visit this well. Next slide, please. This is its current tradition, b condition because the monsoon nearly filled it and it's washed the paint off. And later they will repaint it and it will have its former glory. Uh, right, the last slide. These are, almost all of these people were associated with the exchange. Um, Shahid Bavaz, Mina Bayer, Lalit Sharma, Hashu Kumar Sharma, Ramavashtashan. Suresh, he sadly died, wonderful painter. Um, Vinay Sharma, uh, um, Hindu. Um, and this is Sue Hunt, my friend, who said, why don't we do an exchange in India? We are doing a joint show at Jawala Khali Kandri. Um, this is my wife. And uh, Achana Joshi. Um, all of these people have made a great contribution. They are enthusiastic, they're hardworking, they're talented, and it's a real pleasure working with them. That's the end. Thank you. Sorry if I was around. That's okay. Thank you so much. It was so engrossing. That's why I didn't feel like stopping you. And more, more so because you are mostly talking about others, less about yourself. So we could have given you more time, I think justifiably so. Because you are talking about exchange, exchange of ideas, exchange of students between India and UK. Thank you. And any, any question? I think we have time just for one question. And please think twice before asking it. In the picture from Trondheim, yes. there's a boat in the bottom left corner, what seems to be a boat in the, the, the red painting, and then you seem to see the sea with a boat in the distance. Is the painting hung in front of a window? The, the picture oh. from Trondheim is a red, it's a red painting. Yes, yeah, so Venetian red with a bar across the, the yeah, there front. There seems to be a boat in the distance. Am I misreading that image completely? I th yes, I think you are. No, it's, it, it, was, it was the first in the series. I actually gave it a subtitle called Whaler because uh, it was the first time I used the wooden shaft, which was alluding to a harpoon without... Being. What I want to make clear is that I'm not trying to illustrate a sure, harpoon. Sure, it wasn't that, but the, yeah. it was just the image confused me. It seemed to be that you could see beyond the painting, as if it was hanging in front of a window, you could see the, uh, the sea. I think, I, I think it's, it's an illusion it's, that no, you have perceived that I didn't. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. I'll, I'll have to I'll go back and look at that side again. again with you. Bear your okay. remarks okay. in mind. Yes, yes, yes. No, I, that, that was, yes, sir. I, I shall look at that photograph more carefully. <laughs> oh. I just want to say that the Stepwell photographs at the end are absolutely yes. astonishing. But there's a great similarity with the, your general aesthetic when you talk about using chevrons. I can see that although you're making documentary photographs, you are actually, there's actually a very painterly. Uh, aspect to them. Is, is that deliberate? I have said actually in catalogues, um, I'm acutely aware of the fact that I, my work covers a broad spectrum of areas. I mean, to be interested in American cars and non-figurative abstract painting doesn't even make much sense. I mean, what I didn't show you today, for example, is a series of drawings I've done with Cadillacs, photographically perfect, 
with shrines from, from traditional Japanese artists mounted on the back like hearses. I mean, this is absurd, really. The thing is, I hope that no matter what subject I'm dealing with, it is my desire, my wish, whether I'm successful or not, it's for other people to judge, that I bring the same kind of rigour and the same kind of attention to detail and as, get them as good as I can uh, within the limitations of my skill. So I would hope that the, the abstract paintings and the photographs and the drawings, whatever, all do have that quality, uh, uh, that, that kind of commonality which runs through it. And sometimes people will come to my exhibitions and I might sh have chosen three galleries at once and each gallery will be a different one. One, will, one gallery would just have the step wells in, one gallery would have just the abstract paintings, one gallery would just have the American card drawings. Three different kinds of work. Um, but most people who know my work understand that process and I'm grateful to them for that. But I would not forgive, I would forgive, it would be completely forgive for people saying how why is there a three person show, is only one name at the front. Uh, I, I, I just, I can't contain my interest in one area. I've always been interested in lots of different things. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you, all of you.